Hey everybody, welcome to the Ultrasound Lecture Series this week here at Metro Health. Pretty excited for today, pretty excited for the content that we're bringing to you. Uh, this month is Echo Month, right? So we're talking about basic bedside cardiac echo and even some advanced topics. So today, Dr. Werner, our fellowship director, is going to bring us a talk about cardiac cases, some various different things that we've seen in the department that really illustrate some important aspects of bedside echocardiography. Now, originally, this talk was given live, but you know what? The recording didn't work out so well. So we are actually re-recording it, or actually we re-recorded it, and we're bringing the re-recording to you because it gives you better audio and better video content. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Werner and have her take it away and teach us more about bedside echo. Your patient is tacky and dyspneic to boot. Are they wet? Are they dry? Are they just fixin' to die? But have no fear, as fast as sound, the answer is near. Images appear with POCUS. All is clear. This is Sandy Werner. I'm the fellowship director at Metro Health Medical Center. And these are just a few of our cases that have come through the ED in the last several years that we thought we would share with you all on our ultrasound series. I don't have any conflicts of interest. And our objectives today are to use cardiothoracic ultrasound to narrow the differential and guide your treatment in patients with shortness of breath, to identify pericardial effusions with POCUS and determine the appropriate treatment depending on the effusion, and also to identify some intracardiac masses. So your first case, the beginning of your shift, EMS brings in an elderly patient from a nursing home with no documentation except a piece of paper that says he's short of breath. Of course, he's severely demented. So on your exam, he's in moderate respiratory distress, has some crackles and wheezes, and about one plus pitting edema to the lower extremities. He is afebrile, a little bit tacky, tachypnic, and his blood pressure is maybe borderline low. Is he wet? Is he dry? I don't know, but who can we call? I couldn't find a Sono Busters squad, but we have the Sono squad. So you're going to call the Sono Squad, and where are you going to look? Well, you're going to look at your lungs, looking at the pleura anteriorly, posteriorly, and laterally, so kind of a blue protocol. You're also going to look at the heart and the IVC. So we're looking at the pump, we're looking at the tank, we're looking for places that the tank can be leaking, and also if there's any obvious infectious process. So here's our first patient who's the Kipnik little tachycardic. This is our parasternal long axis view. And without even doing any measurements, you can tell that this squeeze is less than optimal. And you can even eyeball your EPSS and see that that posterior mitral valve leaflet doesn't come anywhere near to the septum. And here is our parasternal short axis view. And again, you can see not a very great squeeze. That fish mouth of the mitral valve is not opening too wide. And a quick look at the IVC, even without measuring it, you can look at the measurement, uh, measurement on the side and see that it's quite large and you can see those hepatic veins pretty well. And of course our lungs, immediately you say lots of B lines. So of course you've ordered all your labs and, and uh, your x-ray and all of that is pending. But with ultrasound, we already pretty much have a diagnosis. And just to confirm it, in our right upper quadrant view, we have a nice, simple pleural effusion. So pretty well diagnostic of what's going on here. He's probably got CHF. He could probably use some diuretics. Maybe some afterload and preload reduction. But you know, we also might want to think about inotropes because of his blood pressure. So we've gotten a pretty good clinical picture with just your vital signs and your sono squad. So we're gonna rewind this case, blah, 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 back to the beginning. Our demented gentleman, who we have no history on, who's in moderate respiratory distress, still has the crackles and wheezes and some pitting edema, and gee, the same vital signs. Is he wet? Is he dry? I don't know, let's take a look. So first of all, just looking at the IVC, you can see that those antlers of the hepatic veins are quite enlarged all the way out and the IVC looks pretty chunky. And our subcostal view, yeah, 
again, we can't really tell the squeeze very well on this view, but you know, something may be kind of jumping out at you. This kind of strange looking area here, this mitral, atri mitral uh, aortic valve complex. And what is going on here? So let's take another look. So your parasternal long axis view, and we're, we have an irregular heartbeat because he's in a fib. And you can see that there's something kind of strange going on by the aortic valve and the mitral valve. So we're going to kind of focus in on that. And you can also see that his squeeze is pretty good. It's not a horrible squeeze. And here is our aortic valve. I'm going to try and go back one. There we go. See if we can get the video on this one. There we go. So here's just, we've angled a little bit so that we can see that aortic valve. And you can see it's really calcified and there's not a lot of movement there. And also the mitral valve, that posterior leaflet, doesn't seem to be moving very much. If we look at that aortic valve in the short axis, or transverse, you can see that it doesn't really open very wide. And if you listen, this guy has probably got a very impressive murmur. Look at his lungs, and of course, lots of bee lines. It's all bee lines, so pretty wet. So diagnosis and treatment in this patient, yes, he's got CHF, but he's also got aortic stenosis. And based on your exam and your ultrasound, it's probably a critical aortic stenosis. So treatment for him, diurese, what happens if we, re if we reduce that preload and we can no he can no longer squeeze that fluid out past that that small aortic valve, bad things will happen. So let's not diurese him. Uh, how about some pressors? You know, you actually might want to do that. And they recommend phenylephrine and norepi, so you just decrease that vascular space. If you increase the rate, his heart rate, you can actually decrease the filling time, and you need that filling time to get enough blood into that left uh, ventricle to actually force it through that aorta. But what he really needs is an aortic valve replacement. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they, they can do this now without opening up the chest. And if he's a fairly healthy person, he, this might be something that he is a candidate for. If he's our demented elderly gentleman from the nursing home, I'm not sure. But that's something to think about. If your facility doesn't do that, you may want to talk with family, talk with um, somewhere else that you can transfer him. You might be able to. So we're going to rewind just our same with respiratory distress is he dry take a look at that heart he's tacky got good squeeze, but ventricle is really not even filling those walls are coming together kissing ventricular walls and if we take a look at his lungs You can see that pleural line. You can see the ants marching along it, but really not much in the way of bee lines. And the same with the other lung. And we want to check both lungs because we want to make sure he doesn't have a pneumothorax. And there's lung sliding with barely a bee line. So based on our exam, he's probably not fluid overloaded. He probably needs uh, some basic COPD treatment, and he might need some, some IVF because he clearly needs some fluid based on his heart. And now we're kind of going to switch gears, something completely different, a 16-year-old who had a cardiac arrest, and amazingly, they got ROSC. So take a look at the heart. Pretty decent squeeze. Left ventricle looks a little funny to me. It's almost like it's bowed in. And the septum, you know, you may be thinking that it's it's large, but it's not really too thick. So the septum can be about 1.1 centimeters in diastole and about 0.6 in systole. So his his is really not not um, not that dilated, but it does look like it's being compressed. And in fact, if we do this EP, 
SS, you can see your septal line, and then you can see that posterior mitral valve leaflet. And it's actually crossing over the septum, or in reality, the septum is being pushed in to the valve space. So let's take a look at the apical view. And here, you know, I'm thinking, geez, do I have my probe reversed? Uh, no, I've got thicker walls on the right side, so that is the left ventricle, but the right ventricle is too big. And as I'm watching this, I can actually see the septum being pushed over into that left ventricle. And if I go to the short axis, I notice that, you know, in this 16-year-old kid, he probably doesn't have right ventricular strain to start with, but I notice that his left ventricle no longer has that nice donut shape. It's actually shaped like the letter D. So I'm pretty confident that this is a PE. I'm pretty confident it's a massive PE. Uh, so your treatment options, TPA, does this guy need a thrombectomy? We don't actually know what happened to this guy because he got transferred to another hospital. So right heart strain associated with PE. Just remember, you're going to have a dilated RV with not very much wall motion. And normally, the RV should be smaller than the LV. And this is hard to, to see on some of the views. It's difficult to see, particularly on your subxiphoid view, because you can actually change the angle. Um, but it's really easy to see this on the apical view. So that will be the view of choice. And the abnormal collapse of the septal wall. And of course, you might see a clot in the RVOT if it's very large. And then McConnell sign, not necessarily diagnostic, but something to look for. This is when you have preserved function of the apex of the RV. So the rest of it isn't really moving, but that little apex is trying to, trying to squeeze. Just remember, you can have a very large PE without right heart strain, and you can also have pre-existing right heart strain. Typically, you'll have thick RV walls, and this will be in someone with uh, already known underlying pulmonary disease and core pulmonale. All right, so moving on in your shift, it's kind of a shortness of breath, chest pain but day. And this gentleman is uh, comes into triage. It's a really busy day. We're having a COVID surge. His blood pressure is pretty high. His pulse is a little tacky. He tells the triage nurse that he's been using cocaine. He last used about four hours ago. And now he's having this left-sided chest pain and it kind of goes into his shoulder. And they say, well, uh, we don't have any beds at the moment, but we'll stick you in the hall. And of course, there he sits for a while because nobody really realizes that perhaps he needs to be attended to. And suddenly, one of the nurses walks by him and finds that he's unresponsive. So we actually get him into a real room, take some uh, vital signs. Blood pressure is not so good. His uh, heart rate is also not so good. His respiratory rate is not good as well. And his pulse ox is now 70%. So of course, we're going to do the immediate resuscitation. And then we're also going to throw the ultrasound probe on to see what might be going on here. And I see the left ventricle in the lower field. It's kind of being squished. I can see the right ventricle. It's kind of bowing a little strangely, and I can't even hardly see that right atrium. It just looks like it's collapsed. And above that is fluid. So I had this hypertensive guy using cocaine, came in with elevated blood pressure, and he's now hypotensive. So I'm thinking something very bad is going on. And just to confirm it, we'll take a look at the abdominal aorta, and you can see that there are two flow patterns here, and you can actually see the line that separates the true lumen from the false lumen. So this guy has a very nice dissection that has actually resulted in tamponade. And the question is, what do we do? IVF, maybe as a temporizing measure, pericardiocentesis. There's not a lot of evidence, but what there is suggests against it because as you're pulling the fluid out from that pericardial sac, you're just inviting more to come in and increasing the pressure. So it just keeps coming in, you suck it out, and it keeps coming in, and it can actually increase the size of the pericardial effusion. So this guy needs to go to the OR, or if you don't have a uh, cardiothoracic surgeon that can take care of this, they need to be transferred. Um, not very likely to have a great outcome from this, however. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about dissections. So typically they start in the aortic arch and then they either move down towards the abdominal aorta or they can move retrograde 
into the, the um, heart. And the reason you get this dissection is because of the right coronary cusp. So right where the right coronary artery comes off and there's that cusp, there's a fold and the false lumen can open up a lumen right where that fold is and then you get that nice sac of fluid around the heart. So if you have a dissection, hope that it just goes, uh, that it goes distally and doesn't come back proximally. All right, so we're gonna move on to something else. We've gotten that guy transferred off. Phew, and now we have a patient. Um, he's actually in a, a side room, but he has a monitor. He's um, ill appearing. Uh, he has known lung cancer. He's tachycardic. He's a little bit uh, hypotensive. He's hypoxic in spite of being on high flow oxygen. He really doesn't want to be intubated. So you're kind of worried that he's uh, fixing to... Oh, and by the way, this was his last chest x-ray. Um, so not in, not in a good place. His current chest x-ray looks like this. And there's a pigtail. It almost looks like it's in the bowel on the patient's left side, but it's not. It's actually in the appropriate place and it's draining. So he's had this pleural effusion for a while and we decide perhaps we should look at it because the left heart border is kind of far over. And when you go to take a look at the, at the pleural effusion, you're struck by this other effusion. He's actually got a very large pericardial effusion. You can see the anatomy of the heart very well because it's surrounded by fluid. And you also notice that there's some echoes in that fluid. And that's typical of a, a, uh, an effusion that's malignant in nature or if it's renal in nature, uh, they can often have particulate matter in them. So, and you'll also notice how large this effusion is. Remember, the pericardial sac doesn't stretch very well, which is why your trauma patients decompensate with a very small effusion. But over a couple of months, you can accumulate more than a liter of fluid. And in fact, I think they took a liter, uh, 1.2 liters off of this guy from this effusion. So over time, the pericardium can stretch and you can get these really large effusions. So your next question is, you know, is this tamponade? And I can see that right ventricular outflow tract pretty well. It's not squished. Um, it's definitely got some uh, slightly dilated um, or slightly uh, large uh, LV walls. Ooh, that was interesting. Okay. So our parasternal short axis. Looks like he's probably got some maybe pre-existing right heart strain. There's a shadow there, but can see the right ventricular outflow tract, not horribly. Nice effusion surrounding everything. Your apical view, little hard to see the right ventricle. Maybe that it's collapsed. It may be that the heart is just rotated, so it's actually behind the LV. And onto our subxiphoid view, nice liver window. And you know, that RV does look like it's probably bowing, but the atrium is filling and it's compressing when it should. So I don't see that there's collapse of the atrium in systole. So he might be borderline tamponade. Oh, and by the way, this was his chest X-ray two months ago. So he still had this large pleural effusion with the pigtail, but he did not have the uh, uh, heart border, the right heart border going way over into the lung. So what are we going to do for this guy? Well, first, it's a malignant pericardial effusion. And, you know, we're getting there borderline tamponade. So maybe some IV fluid as a temporizing measure. You know, he probably, if he's in an ED that has a capability or, I mean, can send him to cardiology, he could probably benefit from a window or a drain. You might, especially if you're going to transfer him, you might go ahead and do a pericardiocentesis and put a pigtail there so it can be drained if further if it needs to be while he's in transport. Um, this guy in RED went up to cardiology and they actually put in a pigtail drain. The initial amount of fluid that they got out was 1.2 liters. So it can be a really large effusion before they start to show any signs of tamponade. So pericardial effusions, tamponade, they have RV collapse during diastole and right atrium collapse during systole because during systole, the right atrium should be filling up. And if it's collapsing instead, that just means that the blood is going into the effusion. So this can be hard to see real time, 
but you can often do a cine loop and go back through slowly and figure out when the heart is in diastole and when it's in systole, and then you can get a better feel for if it's actually showing signs of tamponade. Your IVC will typically be large and without respiratory variation, and then of course the clinical correlation. If they have a really large effusion, but their vital signs are pretty stable, um, you know, they probably need attention to it, but probably not in your emergency department. And does size matter? Well, yes, or time matters perhaps. So in this case, we have a very large effusion, but it accumulated slowly. So we're kind of borderline tamponade. In this case, we have a much smaller effusion, but the pericardial sac has not had a chance to, ex to expand or to stretch. And so this small effusion is leading to tamponade. And really, you know, the only way to get to this and to fix it is probably to, whoops, to deliver the heart um, and open that pericardial sac. Where'd my other one go? What if your tamponade looks like this? This is not playing the video, but you'll see that this heart actually is still beating. This is a trauma patient, a stab wound, and it looks like that heart is still trying. And really the only way that you're gonna fix this because this pericardial fluid is all clotted it's just a large blood clot. If you try to stick a needle in that, it's going to have no effect. But if you deliver the heart, all will be good. Maybe. All right, moving on to something entirely different. So this is a gentleman, about 45 years old. He comes in to the ED um, for back pain, and he's triaged to the low acuity area. He didn't give the triage folks his history of IV drug abuse, but of course he tells you this and you decide, mm, this guy really needs an MRI. I've got to make sure he doesn't have an epidural abscess. And he's hanging out waiting for his MRI for many hours. And you go back to reassess him and oh my goodness, he's not stable anymore. He's become hypoxic, tachypnic. Now he's febrile. He's tachycardic. In fact, he meets sepsis criteria. So let's get him out of the low acuity area. Let's stick him uh, over on the high acuity area and let's take a look with ultrasound to see what's going on. Well, his lungs are wet, but his IVC is very small. In fact, hard to see that little IVC. So that's gonna help us guide treatment. He's really tacky. And in this view, you know, my eyes keep going towards the tricuspid valve. Hmm. In this view too, it looks like there's something moving with the tricuspid valve. And thinking that there is. And although you can't always diagnose this with TTE, I'm thinking that this person has endocarditis and now they're septic, and maybe they have an epidural uh, abscess as well. So we already know we're in trouble with the airway because he's got a teeny IVC and we know his lungs are wet and he's hypoxic and tachypnic. So we're gonna need to intubate this guy. We're gonna need to give him, you know, maybe not fluids, but actually use some vasopressors and of course some antibiotics. And this is somebody who's gonna need the operating room or he's going to need to be transferred. Your antibiotics might help, um, but if they're in, in uh, failure from this, they generally will need to have uh, an operation. This gentleman got transferred to a different center, but we did draw blood cultures before he left and they grew some strange gram negative organism. And it turns out that he had been hiding his uh, drug paraphernalia. He'd been burying it in the backyard so his wife wouldn't know that he'd been using again. So um, not a terrific outcome in this case. And again, you can't necessarily diagnose endocarditis with your TTE, but oftentimes you'll see it, so it's worth looking. Okay, and this gentleman, now you're out in the area that we stick patients who have been triaged and we decide that they need to go to the acute area, but we don't really have a bed yet. And he's a 59 year old male and he comes in He's had two months of epigastric pain and weight loss. He went to see his primary care doc and he went to CT and they sent him to the ED for something in his heart. And your resident says, oh, you know what? And his wife is on the board of the foundation for the hospital. 
Uh, and sure enough, you go to see them and you actually know her. So you're trying to make sure that you do really the right thing. He has a past medical history only of, she says it was a pretty bad heart attack. And on his CT, well, we can obviously see that there's not so good things happening in the liver. But take a look here as well. So the pancreas is kind of large. It looks kind of funky. And I don't really like what's happening to the SMA either. Uh, so I'm a little bit worried about that. Let's take a look at his heart. And you notice the squeeze isn't bad, except up at the apex. And there's something kind of funny in that apex. Hmm. And on CT, in fact, they had seen the same thing. And they thought it was probably a blood clot. And it probably is. Looks like it's been there for a while. It's already got some echogenicity in the um, outer wall of the, the uh, clot. And this is his EKG from about a year ago. Um, and you can see the Q waves anteriorly. And of course, he had a large anteroapical infarct. So that's why that apex isn't squeezing well. And that's why you have a nice little thrombus there. So what are we going to do with this guy? Well, uh, of course, he's got the LV thrombus and cardiology says, oh, no, you need to anticoagulate him. And you're thinking about this CT and the read is that it's it's um, it's not has not quite invaded the SMA and also the splenic vessels. Uh, but that's kind of a concern. And you decide you'll run it by Hemonc and they're not sure about anticoagulating him. So the best thing is to admit him to Hemonc and uh, let him onk and cards duke it out. So they wound up doing heparin on this guy, but, but they didn't want to put him on anything long acting until they got a better feel of what was going on with the pancreatic cancer. Uh, but this was not something that, that uh, um, we made the decision on. We actually got our experts involved in and let them duke it out. And then of course, in the CDU, your clinical decision unit, your fellow is doing some scanning and there's a guy, an elderly man, who's going to uh, have a stress test. He came in with chest pain and some syncope and he says, hey, I'm going to go over and scan this guy. And he does. And there's subcostal view. He comes back and he says, there's something strange going on here and shows you the views. Subcostal, apical view. And you notice that, yes, there is something strange in the left atrium. There's this kind of mass thing. And indeed, there is. So he's having syncope because this nice myxoma is going into the mitral valve and actually causing his blood flow to essentially stop. And then when he has the syncope and is down flat, it comes out of the mitral valve and he returns to circulation. So... Nice myxoma. First thing you're going to do is abort that stress test. Probably not a really good idea. And consult cardiology and CT surgery because the treatment for this is to actually remove it before it gets so large that it's being removed on an autopsy. And these things typically attach to the intraatrial septal wall or they can attach to the posterior uh, wall or the free wall of the atrium, but they're often on a stalk and they're kind of mobile and they can actually go down into the mitral valve, which is uh, what we saw in this case. All right, I think we're done with our day. You've had a busy shift. You've called on your Sono squad and gotten a lot of things done. In fact, you went through cardiothoracic ultrasound to figure out you're in your short of breath patients, the differential and guide your initial treatment uh, and figured out that you could actually see the aortic valve stenosis and that stopped you from, from uh, giving a lot of diuretics and appropriately treating this person. You identified some pericardial effusions and determined the appropriate treatment depending on the size of the effusion and the um, evidence for tamponade. And then we also looked at a couple of intracardiac masses using point-of-care ultrasound.